as far as the public private, I think uh, you know our our ideal is to get the private sector to um, invest as much as they possibly can to make this happen. Uh, they're they're the prime beneficiaries. I mean, apart from the public, but uh, developers are, are prime beneficiaries of, of the work that's going on. Here. So more more work to we can smile. more work to come on that in the next phase. Meg Linden, anyone on your side? Like yes. It? It works. Uh, land area, when you factor in the uh, appropriate uh, densities under the central uh, waterfront plan and secondary plan, would result in additional density and additional development. Thank you very much. On the modified 4WS plan, if you had to kind of condense all that information, what is the main advantage of the realigned 4WS versus the original 4WS? What is the main deciding factor to say we need to go along with the realigned 4WS? Development blocks. The um, uh, is it cost? Is it, is it, you mentioned 150 million. Well, no, if cost was the only thing, we'd probably go with the cheapest version. But we're not going with the cheapest version. We're actually looking at a balanced view of things. So it's not simply cost. It's not simply the development area. It, it's really on balance. What are the you know what's the best solution? Because as you, as you probably are aware, that original 4WS plan was a, uh, a plan that was recognized worldwide as being uh, a good example of urban development. And so my concern would be, are we compromising on that, that original plan? Hold on to that thought as we get to the opinion. Let's get back to that. So you can see it. Acres or hectares? Hectares, pardon me. Um, so overall, about uh, a four hectare reduction. However, with respect to the areas on the keys, it's about a one hectare reduction. So just so I understand, the last time it was 40 acres and now it's only four? The, the last time we met, we weren't actually looking at um, any part of the parkland equation. Last time we met, we were talking about floodplain only. Um, so there hadn't been a reduction of 40 acres, we just hadn't shown any parkland in the previous versions. Okay, well, we were told 40 acres at that time. Okay, so you got the, the current state. Rapid transit as a possibility. What were you thinking of in terms of rapid transit? Um, still to be defined uh, entirely, but it will be phased in. We expect it to be phased in over the uh, uh, life of development, starting with um, you know, bus service in its own lane, so rapid, um, rapid bus service. Ultimately, um, an LRT um, rapid transit solution um, is what the original EA had and is what uh, is being considered uh, now. Back here. You say that that would happen before the, it goes back to council? Yes, we, we'll do some preliminary design before it goes back to council. That's pretty good news. Um, what Have you put your mind to what that process will be and how the public will engage in that? Um, at this point, we have it. I mean, well, the public will engage. We will we'll come back with that to the to the next round of uh, consultation. Beyond that, the public will be engaged in the EA process. As we go through the EA process, as we uh, come out of council um, accepting the plan, um, is probably a 15 to 18 month process, which will require um, all of the statutory public meetings and public involvement that um, an EA process requires. Clarify that a little bit. I'm trying to understand what the EA process would be after if, if, if council says, you know, okay, we agree with this concept. What, what do you what do you see in the EA, EA process after that point? Well, the EA process. No. Well, um, I might actually defer that question to our EA experts. One of us has an EA kind of put together. Uh, the the actual EA process is not determined at this stage. Uh, it depends on the outcome of this work and how it informs and directs the EA. The number of public meetings, the level of involvement still have to be resolved. And there'll be a dialogue between the parties and a recommendation to council, as well as dialogue with the MOE to make sure that the appropriate framework is put in place. Hi, I'm Paul, I'm the Bank Group. And I was just curious as to why um, the phase three is basically why phase two is prioritized over phase three. Because it wasn't picture of you from the presentation. I'm going to turn that over to the experts again, actually. 
Can I do that? Which expert? Nope. Dawn, maybe. Many, or, many, many experts. Yes, yes. <laughs> a, a, river, a river expert. Oh, but also can take this one. experts will uh, add in if need be. Really, we have to, we put the phasing together in the most logical sequence that we can we can pull out. First, the phase one is the spillway straight south. We've got to get the water out of the area north of uh, the the key channel and get it out of there and move it south. Or south. The second phase actually does a number of things. It opens up the uh, the sediment breach. Area, really the area north of Lakeshore. We have about four or five things that need to be done all in, in that phase. First off, we have to open up the Lakeshore, uh, bri or Lakeshore Road, that bridge that goes across Lakeshore to allow the conveyance of water. We'll then open up the river to convey through there. We have to raise the Dawn Roadway and the lands to the east so that we're really providing a structure that will keep the water uh, flowing through the spillway. And we have two or three other elements there that have to be done. You can't really do uh, the river section before you do a number of those other things, or you haven't got anything to direct the water to. You've got to do those other things to get the water to that point. Don't know if that makes sense, but um, I can try it again and get somebody else. Thank you. We have about five more minutes at this point, and if you don't get on on this time, we've got an hour or more of opinion and other questions to come. So, Megalyn, for you. I looked on regarding that, and I wasn't sure it was clear. What are the examples of high river uses? So the, the current um, restrictions on development in the Portlands to the floodplain um, allow only for minor um, alterations and additions that are consistent with existing zoning. Existing zoning is predominantly industrial zoning in the Portlands, and the densities are not very large. Um, higher order uses, the highest and best uses involve um, residential, commercial, retail um, uses. Those cannot be um, planned or approved um, while the lands are still in the floodplain uh, under the restrictions imposed by the province. So you could not actually go down and build a residential um, facility uh, on the floodplain if it's not currently allowed by the zoning, and for the most part, it isn't. Okay. Jim? Already out of the floodplain. Uh, is there going to be further uh, anything further about uh, early utilization of that basin? Um, there are actually two two lands north of King Channel. One is the Home Depot lands, and they're proceeding through a planning and um, uh, well, I guess a planning process to get their approvals in place. Um, the other piece of land is Forty Lakeshore. Um, I think there's a um, There'll be some looking done at Forty Lakeshore over time, um, but it's not going to be one of the earlier development to the blocks for a number of reasons. Um, it is uh, encumbered by a number of existing um, easements uh, to the railways. Um, it includes a bunch of tracks that go through it that serve a bunch of properties, and you know, there. Um, and um, and for that reason, it won't be a, it won't be a simple matter to develop that piece of property. Um, and in, in fact, it's probably not the greatest piece of property to develop first, given its location between the Gardner Expressway and the embankment of the sea and track. So it may very well be an infill piece at some later point. Um, but that I mean that's our assumption at this point from a planning perspective. That may change over time. Um, we can't say for sure. Okay, we'll take a couple more. Again, we have lots more time. Wave your hand high if you. It's an absolute burning question that you need to have answered before you can weigh in, Megalyn. For the Portlands, um, and have not considered it to be one of the potential transformational initiatives. That's a, and ultimately the, any decisions on casinos will go through the uh, appropriate process at City Council. We're not looking at it as part of what we're doing. Okay. There's a lot of discussion about the rest of the Portlands, kind of dividing things into precincts and what, what uh, some preliminary ideas for what would go on there. And um, tonight, of course, is very much focused on the Lower Dawnlands. So I'm wondering if you could make any comments about any additional work that the team has done on the rest of the Portlands. Yes, in fact, you know, we've looked at the potential infrastructure costs for um, what we're calling Precinct G, which is the area adjacent to Lakeshore between uh, Carlaw and Leslie Street. Um, that will be a, a infill development, however, given the uses that exist that, that exists there. They're not like, um, it's not like a greenfield site. There are a number of 
um, you know, businesses, new businesses, and some older businesses, established businesses. So there may be some infill development that happens there. Um, and we've looked at that, but it's not a planning issue from our perspective. It'll be handled through the, uh, the appropriate city planning process. With respect to south of the ship channel, um, yeah, something may or may not happen with the Hearn. The Hearn is uh, uh, released to a, a development group and they've been looking at you know, potential uses for that and they'll continue to. Uh, but as far as the balance of the ship channel or the areas of the ship channel goes, um, those are pretty heavy industrial uses um, that are critical to the operation of the city and, and the analysis we've done suggests they should remain um, and continue and be encouraged to uh, continue for as long as they need to. I, I just I, I, I need to understand where the Lafarge is because I'm not really clear on that. I'm going to move away from the desk for this one. Okay. Use your finger. Looking at the diagram here, I don't see what bridges have been removed from the original plan. The, in fact, the bridge that's been removed from the original plan isn't even shown on this one. It's a bridge across, uh, across the Keating Channel at Munition Street. Um, it's just not shown on this plan at the moment. Um, with respect to the other plans, you can see that the uh, bridge from Villiers to Commissioners and the bridge across the river at um, Cherry Street uh, are both, you know, that they're like bridges on the all other plan are substantially um, shorter, um, less expensive. Okay. One last question from Twitter from the webcast. Yeah, it's, it's uh, from the chat room, uh, David. Can you, question is, can you expand industrial uses without flood protection infrastructure? Um, within the existing zoning and provided they do not impact on, those expansions do not do not impact in an adverse way on other landowners from a flood perspective, yes you can. Um, if you, to, to explain that, you, if you raise the grade and the building is no longer flooded, that means they can probably go ahead um, unless raising the grade actually impedes the flow of water and you get back up on another piece of property and you impact that piece of property, then they may not be able to go ahead. Okay, thanks for the conciseness and thanks for the answers, David. Any overflow questions, we'll get them a little bit later, but I did want to switch you into